It's um, 12.15. Uh, it looks like there's a, a little uh, a rapid surge of people showing up. So maybe, maybe we'll give people another two or three minutes. Um, yeah. Because, uh, you know, who starts on time, really? Come on. Yeah. Uh, so and then uh, and then I'll I'll um, I'll announce you. So as I said, uh, we'll go until we'll go for trying to try and, uh, try and wrap up uh, in an hour, and then we'll have a Q and A. Okay. Okay. So, good. Hi, Ibu. Hi. Good stuff. You like good stuff? Yes. Oh, how are you? I'm fine. Thank you. I will I will switch off because I'm uh, my family is working. Uh, <laughs> Hard thing. Uh, it's okay. Good. I I am getting uh, twenty five pounds of flour shipped from South Carolina. Oh, oh! Why? Send me send me the URL. I will, I will send you, yeah. It took uh, three weeks, though. I've been trying to find flour for a long time. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Luck, luckily, I stock, luckily, I always, because I bake regularly anyway, I, I had quite a backlog, but I'm, I'm running dangerously low, so. Uh, yeah. Yeah, good. I, I need Okay. <laughs> That's quite a bit. Okay, looks like uh, the surge, is, oh, yeah, the surge continues. Okay, maybe we'll get you started um, uh, so you have uh, plenty of time. Okay. Okay, so, um, well, it's a pleasure. Uh, uh, welcome, everyone. It's a pleasure to have today uh, Ibrahim Ba, who's going to be talking all the way from Johns Hopkins University. He's joining us here at the... Uh, USC seminar series. Uh, his title is Anomaly Inflow and Geometric Engineering of Quantum Field Theory. Uh, just to remind everyone, if you have an urgent question, do jump in, or even if it's only semi-urgent, do unmute yourself and jump in and we'll see if that works. Uh, if you prefer, you can put a question uh, in the uh, chat window and uh, one of us will hopefully catch it and, and, uh, and, and call it out uh, or ask you to speak. And, uh, but we will, of course, also have a Q&A um, after Ibu has finished speaking, where we'll open mics and let people uh, go back and forth. So without further ado, welcome Ibu. Okay, thanks for inviting me back at USC, um, although, even though we're very far apart. Um, so I actually prefer, if you have a question, just go ahead and interrupt, and I will um, try to answer. Um, I mean, it's good to try to make it as sort of regular standard seminars as possible. Okay, so <clears throat> the, let's see, does this work? Okay, very good. So, um, so geometric engineering in, of quantum field theory is, is very powerful, you know, for studying strong dynamics and, 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 and um, various properties of QFTs in general. So this landscape, of course, um, in, we, we've, we've gotten very accustomed to study in, in, in string theory um, where we can make them from brains. And more recently, we can study quite a bit of them by studying compactifications of some high dimensional CFTs onto some manifold, in this case, some manifold X, and then a great deal of the lower dimensional CFT that you get from there um, can be inferred from X. In a sense, X, the manifold X defines this lower DCFT. There is, of course, a great deal of work of this that has happened going back to the 90s, so I will not attempt to sort of cite all of the classic work on it, on geometric engineering in general. But in, uh, basically, in recent times, this thing has received a significant revival um, in, in new directions, uh, with the work of Gaiotto and Gaiotto Mornitsky um, in exploring strongly coupled theories and also the sort of introduction of, of, of uh, non-Lagrangian theories, theories 
with whom we cannot write down Lagrangian, but you're comfortable enough from the geometric setup to actually study such a quantum field theory and say some physical properties of them based on the geometry. And in these constructions, you can, con you can have many different species of, of, of PFTs with a very arbitrarily large flavor symmetry if you want. So this, the hallmark of this is the compactification of 6D CFTs on punctured Riemann surfaces, where you can have arbitrary number of punctures, and each puncture can carry some interesting global symmetry uh, for the for the for the field theory in 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 in, in 4D. So um, as we're getting comfortable with this, and as we're starting to come with terms that you know by some measure, most quantum field theories out there may be non-Lagrangian, meaning you, 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 you may not find a Lagrangian to describe them. It may not exist because there may not be a weak coupling limit of, 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 of the theory. Um, and even in cases, some cases where a Lagrangian exists, you may, it may be very, very hard to extract any physical information. The Lagrangian itself may be sort of useless for the strongly coupled fixed point. Um, so, one thing we would like to know, and one thing that has been happening in the last few years, is trying to figure out how to compute physical observables. And the one example along this is the AGT correspondence, uh, which was about 10 years ago. So in this question, in this talk, the, the, the sort of a thing that I want to focus on is how to compute tooth anomalies for CFTs that you obtain from a geometric uh, construction, from some string theory type construction, or just from some ge ge geometry in general. Um, so this is going to be the main subject of the talk today. So to start, to give you a brief reminder of anomalies and why we care about them so much, you can have tooth anomalies, uh, you can think of them as gauge anomalies for global symmetries. This global symmetry could be Poincaré symmetry, it can be some flavor symmetry, it can be discrete symmetry, it could be higher form symmetry. Any such a thing can carry anomalies with them. So more precisely, we, you can define um, this quantum anomaly as a uh, partition function to be the measurement of, the, of, 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 of how the partition function of your quantum field theory transform under a gauge transformation related to the global symmetry. So here, for example, you consider some background gauge field that you turn on, which is valued in some global symmetry A, in some global symmetry G, you have A prime and A. So under this transformation of the partition function going from A to A prime, you can obtain, for example, some phase, uh, overall phase, meaning the, the, the partition function transforms non-trivially. Um, and this object is typically the thing that encodes. This is, how, this is what we mean by the quantum anomaly uh, uh, for the group G. Here, it is important to, to emphasize that A prime and A are bonafide, are background fields, they're non-dynamical, um, and they are related by some gauge uh, parameter, which I call here epsilon, okay? So when is there a tooth anomaly? So it's not the case that whenever the partition function transforms this way, that you have a tooth anomaly. So when you, a tooth anomaly requires two things. One, it has to be the case that you cannot add some local counter terms on the partition function to cancel off this phase. If you could do that, then you can remove this anomaly and the partition function is invariant. Another condition is also that the alpha must vanish in the limit that I take a to zero. If alpha doesn't vanish in the limit that I take a equal to zero, then actually G is not a symmetry of the quantum theory. It's not a symmetry of the quantum theory in any sense. And the sort of anomalies that, that you might see that falls into this is like the ABJ anomaly or the Carroll anomaly. So they're just um, things where you have a classical symmetry that's not preserved by the quantum theory. However, if alpha does vanish in a equal to zero, the symmetry does exist. The, 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 the does exist for the quantum theory, um, but this anomaly is telling you something else about, about um, the theory itself. What it's actually telling you is an obstruction for gauging the symmetry G. 
I'll say it in another, in another way, part of gauging the symmetry is to take the partition function and integrate over all possible gauge field configuration with some measure. However, if the, if the partition function is transforming non-trivially in the gauge transformation, then it's not a well-defined and the, such an integral itself is not well-defined. So if you have an anomaly, a tooth anomaly, then that's really an obstruction to gauging the symmetry G. So what is nice about it when you have it is that um, the anomaly is renormalized in the RG flow. And what this means then in any effective description of the quantum theory that you have, the anomaly must be reproduced, right? So what this allows you then is it gives you a sort of a tool to constrain the IR phases of quantum systems. Um, it gives you a tool to understand how to construct effective field theory of some of, of, of various quantum systems. Um, and in supersymmetric theories, anomalies, tooth anomalies related to the R symmetry uh, basically encode the central charges uh, for, the, for, the, for the theory, okay? So um, from the point of view of non-Lagrangian theories, uh, you should think tooth anomalies do something more because they actually provide a measure of degree of freedom for the QFT themselves. From this point of view, they are part of the defining data of the theory itself, right? If you don't have a Lagrangian, Lagrangian is in some way is a way of telling you the content of the quantum field theory. But if you don't have a Lagrangian, tooth anomalies can serve at least part of, the, part of that data of telling you some basic degree of freedom associated with the quantum field theory itself. So in this talk, I will focus on most on talking about anomalies for continuous symmetries, only continuous global symmetries. And uh, more specifically, the symmetries that I will discuss are going to be zero form symmetries. So in some upcoming work, we will discuss uh, discrete symmetries and, and, um, and, 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 and things that are related discrete symmetries and higher form symmetries. However, on this talk, we just uh, focus on continuous symmetries. Um, uh, so on this note, the anomaly for QFT on, the two on, on some space, on some even dimensional space, so this is anomaly for continuous zero form symmetry, uh, for continuous symmetry in general, alpha, is obtained from the variation of the effective action of, of, my, of my theory, which is roughly the log of the partition function. So this anomaly you could write as an integral of some local density ID. And this local density in a, will encode all the information you would care about these, these, these anomalies. So, so I, this local density satisfies very specific conditions. So there are the West Aminal consistency conditions, which is um, the condition that, 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 that's related to the Frobenius algebra for the group when acted on the, partition, uh, on the effective action, that tells you that the anomaly satisfies the sense relation, meaning that its derivative is obtained by looking at a variation of some form in one dimension higher. And that form in one dimension higher could be obtained as, as from some antiderivative of, of another form in one dimension even higher. So I is usually a churn simons form, which live on some space and uh, which, which is one dimension higher from the M2D dimension. And the idea is that the space where your quantum field theory live is, is, is a boundary to this odd dimensional space time. And, um, that, and, and the, the, the idea is you, you, you take the quantum field theory and the action of the group, and you extend it onto this uh, larger space. And when it extends on that larger space, then the gauge group behaves more of, the, the, the global symmetry can actually be gauged. And uh, the, 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 the anomaly could be understood as coming from the anomaly of the, of the bulk theory. And we will discuss that more, more, in, in a little bit more, more, more cleanly. But the point is, is that, if you solve the Western Minot consistency conditions, you find that there is this churn simon form that encodes the anomaly in this way here, in this way here. And then this churn simon form could be obtained from a gauge invariant 
form that lives even one dimension higher, right? And this gauge invariant form is a, um, is, is, is a characteristic class of the group, right? So we extend the gauge through the, 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 the symmetry G even further to, 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 to a space with two more dimensions. And there you can construct this object I, um, which is what we typically call the anomaly polynomial. So this anomaly polynomial itself, it depends on the curvatures of the background fields um, in, 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 in M2D plus two. Um, it's, it's, and uh, for, so to, to give a more precise picture of what this thing does, so in 4D, for example, the I6, this would be a six dimensional polynomial and it's a polynomial in the curvatures for the group gauge group G and the coefficients that sits up front, these coefficients are exactly what we would get, what, what we call the toast anomalies that we would compute in a perturbative theory with a triangle diagram. If I, if so something that we all used to in quantum field theory is that you look at such a triangle diagram where you have Carl fermions running in the loop and, this, and such a diagram will compute for you um, gauge anomalies associated to a bunch of groups, a uh, bunch of gauge groups that you have here. So the coefficients, so, so those coefficients are exactly, are, are exactly these coefficients Aij that sits in this anomaly polynomial, right? So I6 is this geometric object and the coefficients are what we would typically call the anomaly polynomial. Notice that these anomaly polynomials, of course, they're defined independently from this perturbative sort of a description. So they exist on their own right and could be discussed for any quantum field theory in, in any regime of the coupling. It, this thing is, is something that makes sense to discuss and to, and to talk about. Okay. So, so moving on now, um, the outline of this talk, I will discuss um, some aspects of anomalies of CFTs in M-theory and how we construct our inflow machine. And then I will um, discuss, uh, then I'll do two sets of examples, M5 brains at orbifolds and M5 brains at Riemann surface at, at D2 orbifolds. Uh, so this, this, this first one is going to be a 6D theory. And the second one is going to be a, a, a 4D theory. And there are very interesting physical information that can be extracted and that could be, could be learned. And I will end with a discussion of anomalies of CFT in type 2D. Um, okay. So before we proceed, are there any questions from the, those introductory slides? Okay. Good. So moving forward. So the setup, we, the sort of a setups we'll have in mind is we consider the stack of n m5 brains in m theory. These could be flat, and when they're flat, they describe for you two zero CFTs um, of a n type. Um, for example, these five brains could be probing some uh, singularities, some ADE singularities, and this will yield some bunch of family of one zero SCFTs. I can take the brains and also wrap them on various curved manifolds. X, for example, CFTs in 4D could be obtained by wrapping uh, five brains on, on some two-dimensional spaces and, 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 and so on. So we have in mind the collection of all such a things that one could do in M-theory with five brains to construct quantum field theories in various dimensions. And since we, want, we are talking about M5 brains, so what, what, what happens in M-theory is in presence of, of these brains, uh, the four form flux receives a source, right? So D of G4 is N times delta, where delta localizes on the world volume of the brains. And N here is just a number of brains. So it is useful to split your M theory background into some radial coordinates and then some M10, some 10D space. So at the origin of this radial coordinate, you have the brains that are sitting there. And in, at the origin there, you have a sort of tubular neighborhood of the brain with a boundary and the boundary of that tubular neighborhood is precisely this M10 here. So what are the properties of this M10? 
locally it, it splits into W2D, which would be the world volume of, of whatever quantum field theory that I care about. So what we mean here, this is an external non-compact uh, space time uh, where you can have some quantum field theory that lives there that, that originate from the five frame. And then you, you have a transverse directions, which are compact, which is M10 minus D, okay? So the quantum field theory that we would care about that come from this M5 brain, they live on W2D and, and M10 minus D is a complex space which sort of surrounds this world volume direction. Okay? So locally, this M10 minus 2D is a vibration, is a product of M4 and some compact space X6 minus D. So what is the role of these things? So M4 is the sort of the space that surrounds the brain, right? So for example, if I have flat brains in, in M theory, I have a four sphere that surrounds the brain. But if I put the brains in some orbifold space, or, or if I do something fancier, uh, that, 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 angular, so the angular, that angular space could be more interesting. So we will refer to it as, as, as M4. X6 minus D is a space which the brains wrap, right? It's the extra directions of this compact space, which, is wrap, which must be wrapped by the brain themselves. And then I'm left with a quantum field theory, which could live on W2D. And what we want to know is we want to have a way of computing the anomaly of, of the, whatever quantum field theory that lives on W2D. Okay. So there is a couple of ways to think about this problem. One way to think about this problem is you, you, think about, you take M theory and for the time being forget the brains that are there and you can reduce M theory on the space and on the compact space M10 minus 2D. And when you do this, you get a lower dimensional supergravity with some interesting gauge symmetry G that's propagating in the bulk of that space, okay? So, the, so, this, so that supergravity, to go back to this case, would live on R plus times W2D, right? It's, it's, it's one dimension higher. And at, the, and, and, at, and at the boundary of that, of that space, this is where you would put the brains. That, 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 this is where the quantum field theory that we care about would live. Right? So this would be a boundary theory of some supergravity theory. Um, and that is the basic interplay that, that, that we will study. So now um, this, this gauge group that lives on this, on this, ex on this external supergravity um, has two components of, of, of uh, has two components. One component is coming from the isometry group of, of M10 minus 2D. And another component is coming from the fluctuations of the C3 potential, right? So, so, so you have both the metric and a C3 potential in M theory, uh, the, 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 the group that preserves those objects are going to give you some gauge symmetry in the bulk. So in the case of the metric, we have the isometry group. And in the case of the C3 potential, we can expand the C3 potential along some harmonic modes to get some massless fluctuations in this, in this, in this supergravity. And, and the, those massless vectors will give you some gauge group. Now, when you take this gauge group and you restrict it onto WD on the boundary of the supergravity, uh, theory, then this gauge group induces a global symmetry on this boundary directions. Um, and this global symmetry would act on the brain degree of freedom uh, uh, for, my, for, for, the, for the quantum field theory that lives there. And it will act as a global symmetry, okay? So one of the things that happen is that because you have a singular source for this G4 flux, you, if you study the classical variation of the M theory action, um, you find that it is anomalous, right? There's an anomaly of, the, of this gauge symmetry that lives in the bulk, and this anomaly will always localize at the boundary of, of, of this space. And since the full quantum theory, the full theory of M theory is a consistent theory, it has to be the case that the, the degree of freedom 
on the boundary has to contribute to the anomaly in a way to cancel whatever bulk variation that you have. Okay, and 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 when you and and when that is imposed, then the full system is anomaly free. Okay, so this is the thing that we call an anomaly inflow, right? So you have some bulk theory with some gauge symmetry, and then the gauge symmetry symmetry has an anomaly has an anomalous variation. And uh, when you then we have the anomalous variation which localizes along the boundary, then the boundary degree of freedom, since they transform under this group, uh, uh, they transform under G and G acts as a global symmetry. This global symmetry could carry some, some quantum anomaly because quantum anomalies have to cancel the bulk uh, classical anomalies for the, for the gravitational theory. And this thing goes under the name of anomaly inflow. And what it now allows you to make is that the bulk supergravity action can then be used to study the anomaly of the CFD of the brain. Because of this necessary consistency condition of the, that must be satisfied between the classical supergravity an, uh, anomalous variation and the quantum anomalies that live on the brain, uh, because they have to cancel each other, you could always use the bulk supergravity to try to study the quantum anomalies for the theory that lives on the brain, even when you don't know, when you don't have some short distance description of the theory, when you don't have a Lagrangian for the theory, the, this object could, the brain could be some abstract object, but the bulk supergravity should encode the anomalies for any global symmetry that acts on these degrees of freedom on the bound. So this is, under, this is what we call anomaly inflow in general, and this is a thing we want to study for, 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 for five brain setups in general. So uh, to put in more detail, the anomalous variation of the M-theory action depends on the boundary conditions on G4, right? So from the, the, the G4 in presence of the boundary, the presence of the boundary is encoded as a source for the flux, for the G4 flux uh, here, okay? So if I am trying to study this M-theory background, since G4 has a delta, delta function localized source, it has, I can, I can think of that as, as imposing some boundary condition for G4 um, along this boundary, boundary. So this, we, you can write in this way. So G4 is some two pi times of rho R, so R is this radial R plus direction. And R is basically a bump function that vanishes far away from the brain, but goes to one at the location of the brain. And G4 is exactly the boundary condition uh, for, for, for the flux, which encodes the presence of the brain from the point of view of the bulk uh, supergravity. An integral of G4 is quantized, it's just going to be N because it has to count the number of brains that are sitting there. So the conditions on G4 here is that it has to be closed and it has to be globally defined uh, for form on, on this M10 minus 2D uh, compact space. That's a necessary condition uh, to have a well-defined uh, uh, both variation principle and a well-defined boundary condition for, 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 for the flux. Now, um, since my actual space is just not M10, it is the full, it's not M10 minus D, it is the full M, M10, right? G4 has to be extended to some closed and gauge invariant global form onto the full space time, onto the full space time N, right? So G4, bar is defined on M10 minus D, it must be extended to some E4, which lives on M10, on the full M10. This extension, what it really means is that um, the compact space is fibered over the external world volume of this, uh, where the field theory lives. I can gauge uh, the, 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 the isometry group on, on, on over, over this external uh, space time. And this, and this gauging is what will allow me to construct this E4, which is this extension of G4 onto the full tubular neighborhood of the brain, which is M10, okay? 
So once I have this data, this E4, which is an extension of G4, E4 is going to depend explicitly on, 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 on gauge field uh, value in the isometry group of G. Okay. And from the point of view of the theory that lives on W2D, right, from the point of view of the, of, of the, the theory that lives on the wall volume, the gauging of, 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 of this group that's, that's acting on M10 minus D corresponds to turning on background field for the global symmetry, right? Because G, when localized on the, on the, on the boundary space, G acts in the global symmetry for the boundary degree of freedom. Therefore, the gauge fields that would appear on W2D that are valued in G are going to be not gauge fields, but are going to be background gauge fields for the global symmetry. Right? There's that gauge symmetry doesn't act on, on WD, so it's a background gauge field for the global symmetry. Therefore, this E4 encodes the information about turning on background fields onto W2D. Okay, so you can then go ahead and study the variation of the MT reaction, right? And, and the variation of the MT reaction will have some, will be given by some um, 10 dimensional density, which is integrated on M10. And this 10 dimensional density satisfies also a descent relation. It's given by some 12 form anomaly polynomial I12, which is an anomaly polynomial for the bulk supergravity theory. So this I12, in the case of M theory, if you st study this variation in general, if you study this variation in general, I12 is always given by uh, this form over here, right? It's a, it's a cubic in, 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 in E4, and it has an extra term X8, where X8 is given in terms of Pontryagin classes for the tangent bundle of the M theory background. And you have, and the instruction is to take this, the, to decompose the tangent bundle along here, and then you can compute X8 for this. And X8 is going to encode basically curvature, background curvature terms for the Lorentz group that lives on the brain. So this also encodes gravitational anomalies uh, for, the, for, the, for the Lorentz group and mixed gravitational anomalies that might exist for the, for the, for the theory that lives on the, on the, on the brain on W2. Okay. So once you have this data, so once you use the boundary condition of the flux, construct E4, right? Then you, you, can, you can construct this form I12. And once you have I12 to compute the anomaly for the field theory, you integrate I12 onto the compact space. So if you integrate the, the, the M theory anomaly polynomial on the compact space, you get exactly an anomaly polynomial that can describe uh, the anomaly for, for quantum field theory that lives on M two minus D via the descent procedure. So this I inflow that we compute here is going to be I inflow plus the anomaly for the QFT that lives on, on, the, on the world volume of the brain, uh, on the extended world volume of the brain, plus some other decoupled modes. So this could be free field. For example, it could be the center mass mode of the brain. All of these things have to add up to zero because the full system is anomaly free. The full uh, supergravity theory, including the brain, must be anomaly free. So all of these three terms have to add up to be zero when written as a function of the, of the, of the gauge field. So in, in the bulk, the, the gauge field that you write are actually gauge fields for the gauge symmetry. In the boundary, the, the dependence of I on the gauge field is a dependence on the background fields. You, you, you think of the gauge field there as some background fields. And also in the I decoupling, you think of the gauge field as some background fields for some decoupled, decoupled modes, right? In the case of a five brain, the decoupled mode could be, for example, the center mass mode of my full, of my full system. So this is a sort of general pres prescription of how anomaly inflow in M theory allows you to compute the, 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 the anomaly for QFT that lives on some brain which can wrap 
some, 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 some space, some compact space in which could have any arbitrary configuration that you might, might care about, okay? So to give a brief example, if you consider flat brains in six dimensions, in that case, you have M10, which is this tubular neighborhood around the brain. You have W6, which is the wall volume direction of the, of the, of the brain. And then you have F4, which is the, the round four sphere, which surrounds the brain. Then the flux for this is just N times the volume of the four sphere, right? The flux, the boundary condition for G4 is just N times the volume of the sphere. Um, the, 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 the bulk gauge symmetry that gets imprinted onto the brain is, in addition to the Lorentz symmetry that's there, is the SO5, which, which is the SO5 R symmetry of S4, which is the gauge symmetry in the bulk super, supergravity, but it imprints on the brain as, as, as a global symmetry, and this global symmetry is precisely the R symmetry of the 2 zero theory. So you can consider now the extension of G4 onto the full M10 space. So we do this by gauging the, the, the SO5 symmetry. So here we write the volume of the sphere in the embedding coordinates Y, and we can gauge the SO5 by just turning on some SO5 connections, which is over here, AAB. And FAB is the field, field strength associated to this to, uh, of, of, of these connections um, um, themselves. The parameters alpha one and alpha two are fixed by imposing that E4 is closed in the full space M10, okay? So once you now have this, you have a good candidate for E4, you have a construction of E4, then you can proceed and compute I12 and then when you compute I12, you can integrate it on the sphere. And when you do this, you precisely get the anomaly polynomial for the two zero theory with a decoupled three tensor. So this is the famous computation of three Harvey and Moore and Minasian, where they computed the anomaly of the two zero theory on the brain without knowing anything about it. And this is also the construction that shows that the brain degree of freedom has to scale as F at n cubed. Um, so we will, so, so in general, how do we construct E4? So in general, if, if let's say the brain could be doing some fancy thing along, uh, uh, along some boundary, moreover, the brains could be sitting on, let's say some orbifold fixed point, which can then make the space M10 minus D much more interesting. Um, and G4 in general has to be expanded along some four cycles on M10 minus D, right? G4 is given by picking a, 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 picking a class, picking a, by, by picking some class onto the cohomology group of M10 minus D, right? So if we pick a basis of closed and global forms, V lambda, then G4 is going to be an expansion along V lambda with, some, with, with the index lambda, where lambda goes from one to the dimension of the cohomology group. Okay. Go ahead. Um, in, in the previous calculation, previous page, the, yeah. the function uh, row, the distribution of the, in this case, five brains, mm -hmm. did it play no role? It plays no role. So it's a so, bump function, which you can think of it in, one way you can think of this is the sort of smoothing out of the singularities. Yeah. Um, and one way you can think of this is that the, the role of this bump function is to just sort of pick out the data that's associated to, 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 to the brains themselves, right? You can see as a flux, row G4, if you think of that as a flux, looks actually singular on this tubular neighborhood because rho goes to one, and all of these sub-dominant terms are regular, which are not going to be important. So the bump function just serves to localize your variation onto the brain. Suppose onto then, the location where the brain would agree, agree. Yeah, yeah. Suppose then that I decide not to localize it, so make rho a, a constant 
function of rho or put it in in a place where we know the brain is not so very far away from the position of the brain yeah right? so from that point of view the um the 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 the, the variation the the the, the m theory action is not anomalous so mm -hmm. it, it should be zero so th th that's that, that's what you what that's what you happen the the point is really is that um this whole procedure of adding a bump function and having this function rho it's a sort of regular regularization of the flux so that you can make sense of the of the M theory action in this region, right? Okay. So because G4 has this singular source, you want to have a well-defined variation principle, okay. but it's, it's hard to compute to do that variation if G4 is, 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 is basically blowing up. Right, okay, thank you. So the goal of all of this is to sort of um, reg re to, to regulate uh, the behavior of the action in that region so that you can actually extract the anomaly in a consistent way. Thank you. Good. So, um, good. So in general, the, the, the property, so how do we think about E4 in general? So we think about that if you pick some M10 minus 2D space, which is the angular, which is the space that surrounds the, the, the space where the field theory lives, then G4 is given by some class, by some choice of a class in the cohomology group, right? So we can, we can expand it in this way. Um, then what you have to do is you have to extend, so, so then E4 is an extension of G4 onto the full space that since that extension involves first gauging all of these picking a representative of these, of, of these forms, of these closed forms, V sigma, you can pick a representative. And then this representative is acted up, is, is going to depend non-trivially on the internal space. And, it, and when I gauge the isometry, it's going to become something else, something more, more, more interesting. And it's no longer going to be closed. And because, it's no longer closed, I have to add additional term to correct it. So to, to make this more explicit, if we go back to E4 over here, so it's clear that if I set the connection to zero, then this term, then this term here, if I set the connection A to zero, then this term is just the volume of the sphere in embedding coordinate, and it is going to be closed. But once I gauge it by adding now the, the, the gauge field A, right, then the volume form, although it's now gauge invariant under the action of the SO5, is no longer going to be closed. And the role of, these, of adding these connection terms is precisely uh, the role of those from this point of view is to give you an E4, which is closed and gauge invariant and globally defined, okay? So when we want to consider the generic case, we pick a G4, which is some boundary condition, which is corresponds to picking uh, an element, picking a class in, in, in the cohomology group. Then what you want to do is find a representative for each one of these class, a closed representative for each one of these class, and then you gauge the isometry on that. And when you gauge it, you, you get this new form here, VG, which is no longer closed. But in order to make it closed, I can add terms that are linear in the curvature of the gauge field and terms that are quadratic in the curvature of the gauge field, and then impose that DE4 is all closed. However, there are also additional terms that you can add to E4 over here, which is that um, because M10 is a more inter interesting space, it can have two forms. The homology, the, the cohomology group for, for, for two forms is also non-trivial. You could also enhance E4 with some closed two forms, omega alpha, in some basis alpha, and then those also have to be gauged. So the first F, these FIs are background, are, are curvature, uh, are curvature associated to the gauge field in the is isometry direction, okay? 
And these here are curvature associated to gauge fields that have to do with fluctuations of the C3 potential in, in the supergravity, okay? So whenever you have a C3 potential, then you expand it along a harmonic mode, you get some U1 in the bulk, that so those U1s have, 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 have a few strengths, and this second term precisely picks out those guys there, right? So the first term has to do with the four forms and, and it's related, and, and you have the, the, the curvature is for the, for the, for the isometries appearing, okay? The second term is, has to do with turning on, adding the fluctuations of the C3 potentials that gives you additional symmetry in the bulk. But since I have to gauge those forms, also, you, you see that you get additional terms, which is F alpha, which is a U1 symmetry that does not have to do with the, with the, with the isometry times the curvature of some isometry generated, okay? So as, as we say here, omega alpha are closed in global defined forms, and those also have some gauging in order to make it closed in the full space. And the condition that basically E4 is, is, is closed is equivalent to, to this thing. So these forms omega i and v have to be related in this way. And the sigma, which is a scalar function, is related to omega i in, in this way, right? And similarly, the omega alpha harmonic, the harmonic two forms that I have here um, are related to the sigma alpha in this way, okay? So this is basically how you would construct an E4 given some boundary condition and given the full homology group, the cohomology group, of the space M10 minus V, okay? Again, to reiterate, Fi's are curvature terms for the isometry direction, and F alpha are curvature terms for, for, for U1s that come from fluctuations of the C3 potential. And all together, they give you all curvature terms for the full uh, gauge, for the full global symmetry that's acting on the field theory in the bound. So the, the latter condition here can be summarized by saying that um, E4 is given, is, 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 a, is a class in the G equivariant cohomology of M10 minus E, right? Because you can see E4 in a sense is a sum of polyforms in the, in the, in the, in the, in the compact space. Um, it turns out that uh, if you look at, for example, this equation, there's all sorts of ambiguities that can appear, meaning you can shift omega i, you can shift the sigmas, and all of those things actually wash out in the anomaly computation. Um, and the statement is that actually E4 only depends on the class, on the choice of a class in the G equivariant cohomology of M10 minus D. So once you pick a class in an equivariant class in M10 minus D, then this, this specifies a specific theory, quantum field theory in, 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 in your system. Okay. Any, any questions about this? So it will, let me, <clears throat> let me ask you, mm -hmm. uh, in, in the particular case of the M5 brains and the internal space being the sphere, how many choices do I have? Uh, I, I, I'm asking this from the ignorance of what G equivariant cohomology yes. is. So in that choice, in there, you, know, the, the, you just have a sphere, a sphere, the, the cohomology group, there is a four cycle, which is the volume of the sphere, and then there is a single harmonic scalar, which is just a constant, right? So that's, that's actually boring. So there, the full story is given here, right? So this E4 is all that, that you can have. There are no harmonic two forms, so you couldn't get any additional symmetry from that. Good. Okay, so that, that is an example. But, but as we proceed, there'll be, there'll be more interesting examples, and then you could see how this unfolds. Yeah, I, I believe that. The, the symmetries coming from C3, you would call them baryonic symmetries. That's right. To make the analogy. Okay, good. That's thank right. you. So the thank symmetries you. coming from C3 are, are what we typically call baryonic symmetries, which is here. And, and they are encoded by that one you're pointing to. Yeah. Yeah. And the reason why I am reluctant to use that term here is because 
when I'm starting to compactify theories across dimensions, the meaning of a baryonic symmetry can, can, can be lost. Right. Thank you, Ivo. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, good. So there is one more set of data that, that needs to be given for this, which is that um, even after I pick a class in the G equivariant, a G equivariant class, there is additional ambiguity that exists for E4, meaning I could actually shift it by an arbitrary full form gamma four, which only lives in the external space time, right? I can pick a gamma four, which lives on the external W2D. And um, I can shift G4, E4 in it. The, the issue with this is that um, in the case, for example, of the 6D theory, such a, such a gamma four actually appears in the anomaly polynomial. So there would be an ambiguity of what you mean by this. And you need additional condition to tell you how to fix this. So the condition that we found that should fix this additional ambiguity is that you have to impose the tadpole condition for E4. So even after you pick E4, there is, you can fix additional ambiguities in what E4 is by imposing a tadpole condition which is really taking the equation of motion of the four form flux and imposing that its integral vanished, right? D star G has to, has to be zero. So imposing the tadpole condition onto the internal space um, will fix these additional ambiguities and they turn out to be quite important as we will see in a, in a, in a, in a, in a few moments. Um, I would also, um, so far, I would like to really press upon you that all the conditions that we're using to fix E4 are topological, right? Although, even though we might want to find local representatives to help us understand, to help us construct these, these, these objects, this E4 and such, so far, all the data associated to E4 and all the data that, 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 that sort of fixes, fixes the anomaly uh, of, 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 of my system is topological, right? So this choice of E4 has to do with picking uh, uh, an object in G, a class in G equivariant, a G equivariant class of, of, of the compact space. This tadpole constraint is an integral over the internal space of some uh, globally defined form. So this is also a topological constraint, right? Even we, though we want to write local expression, at the end of the day, the data about the anomaly is related to topological properties of the internal space, not on, doesn't care much about the local properties. So with that, um, so what do we do with this? You can study n equal to, so one thing we, had, we were successfully able to do is to take this sort of a construction and we're able to compute the anomalies for arbitrary punctures um, in, in class S. That, uh, that you care about. And this was a first, first, der first principle derivation of anomalies of, two, of, 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 of class F theories when you compactify on punctured Riemann surfaces. Um, and, uh, and, and our choices of E4 that we could get for that matched one-to-one -one with the classification that exists from, by using Hitchens equations and using other two theoretic techniques. Um, so this was an alternative way of, 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 of studying punctures, which relies more on the topological properties of the geometric engineering than, uh, th than anything else, than on supersymmetry, which was important in writing down the Hitchin equation, for example. So this, allow, this can allow you to then study, you know, systems with less supersymmetry, punctures for n equal to one. You can study uh, one zero theories and their compactification, and in fact, that's the set of examples that I will discuss here. I, in my, in, in my abstract, I promise to discuss Africa punctures, but I don't think I'll have uh, time to, to say much about that. But the examples that I will describe will be nonetheless very interesting, uh, at least from my point of view. Um, you, you can also study uh, D series, one, one, two zero theories of D and E type. And uh, you can study their anomalies in this way. Again, by, uh, in the D series, you have a V2 action on the S2. 
which makes it an RP4, not orientable. Nonetheless, you can study anomaly inflow for this. And the E string theory corresponds to adding some Hojava Witten type wall, and then that will carry additional data. And then those could also be accounted for, and we could study. We haven't done this yet, but uh, I'm convinced that this it should be possible. Okay. So with that said, I will now move on to trying to describe not examples and neat properties that we've, that we've learned, that we've seen in these analysis here. But before I proceed, I can stop for questions. Just to let you know, Ibu, you have um, a, a, about five minutes uh, or so. Wow, five minutes, oh my God. Uh, let's make it 10 because oh, I guess wow. we, started, <laughs> we started a little late. So uh, uh, is 10 workable for you? Oh, I, I will try to push, I will skip through stuff. Okay, uh, well, you know, depending upon questions, uh, uh, we can stretch things a little bit, but uh, okay. just keep that in mind. Okay, Good. carry on. Okay, so first, um, to briefly tell you about five brains at Orbifold. Um, so if you have an M theory on, on uh, so we want to consider five brains probing some R5 mod gamma orbital fixed points. So this was studied uh, long ago by Ken and, 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 and few others. So in this case, the F4 gets replaced by F4 mod gamma. And the, the story about this is that the orbital action on the sphere will have two fixed points at the north and the south pole. So if gamma is of D type, the orbifold preserves the SU2 of subgroup of the SO5, which becomes the R symmetry of, for the field theory. If gamma is, for example, a DK, um, then, then actually the orbifold preserves a U1 times SU2 when K is greater than three, and for K equal to two, it preserves SU2 left times SU2 right. So this is a case also, you know, you also have an interesting flavor symmetry that's coming from the resolution, coming from the orbital fixed points in the North and the South Pole uh, themselves. Uh, <clears throat> okay. So this is a case, this theory, you can, you, the M5 brains basically have a very large global symmetry acting on it. You have the R symmetry, then you have G gamma times G gamma from the North and the South Pole fixed points. And all of these things will carry some anomaly. And these anomalies can be computed using inflow. <clears throat> so, <coughs> so this was actually analyzed by these folks um, a few years ago. And you can, again, uh, put, putting this in the context of our language, you can write an E4, which has a leading E4, which is the volume of the F4 mod gamma and which you, where you gauge all of the symmetries. Then you have a resolution two cycles uh, that, that are in the North and the South Pole and associated to that are harmonic, are, are closed to forms omega here. So when we expand E4 along these omegas, we pick up field trends F, which are background fields for the Cartan elements of the global symmetry that's coming, that is coming from these orbital fixed points. You can proceed then with this E4 and, and compute the, the, the anomaly by integrating uh, over this, the F4 with, with the orbifold. Uh, this is actually also much more interesting because the F4 has these orbifold fixed points, which you can model as some ALE space. So the X8 receives interesting contributions. So you have an interesting contribution coming from the orbifold and also interesting mixed anomaly uh, that you get. And all of this can be computed and it was done in, by two guys. However, there is the anomaly that you get in that case is not quite complete because the E4 that we have is actually has this gamma four ambiguity, which we noted in our paper. And this gamma four ambiguity, we can fix by imposing the tadpole condition. And then you get a gamma four, which is related to the trace of the gauge field of the global symmetry that live in the north and the south. So this actually ends up shifting the anomaly by a gamma four squared. It adds a correction to it uh, due to this tadpole constraint. 
So in, in, in Omori and all paper, uh, this, the, the correction had to, was added by hand and it was interpreted as the green Schwartz term that associated to the decoupled center mass of the stack. In our case, in the supergravity analysis, it actually comes out and it is due to um, having this tackle constraint that must be imposed uh, uh, in order to, to set up this, this, this inflow. So more recently, of course, this term has a very nice um, interpretation and it could be understood. Uh, this should be a paper that should be coming by Ken, Thomas, and Clay, which this, this, this extra term can be understood as, as the fact that the two zero theory cannot have a, a globe, uh, a, a continuous um, um, two form uh, a global. And the fact that you cannot have that implies this green Schwartz term that the Morianol added, which leads to this thing. In the bulk, we only see that we see this coming from the, the, the imposing this stackable constraint. So this is a rather nice little piece of data that you can extract by doing this analysis uh, from, from, from the supergravity setup. Okay, so I'll, I will try to proceed and then we'll take questions in the end. So the other more interesting case, interesting case that we also have studied is the case when you have a Z2, five brains probing a Z2 orbital. This is the case where we can work out almost everything for this story, okay? So for the k equal to two, the orbifold action will preserve some s u two left and some s u two right, where the s u two right becomes the r symmetry. So the brains, um, you know, the, the field theory that the lives on the brain is a one zero CFT and it's generically non Lagrangian. So again, you have the fluctuation of the of the C three, which gives you some s u two north and an s u two south coming from the fixed points on the sphere. And what we will consider in, in, in doing the analysis here is we will resolve those, those, those orbital singularities by blowing up two cycles in the north and the south. And when you do this, this actually breaks the SU2 R symmetry and it breaks the SU2 north and south. So the symmetry of this system is a U1 cubed times SU2, SU2 left, where the U1 here would be like an R symmetry and this are, is the is flavor symmetry, okay? So the, what we're interested in here is, okay, so be, before, what we're interested in is putting this whole thing on a Riemann surface to go down to 4D and, and study the 4D theory that you get by wrapping this one zero theory from the Z2 orbifold on a Riemann surface. So to, to, to make certain things more explicit, when we resolve this, this, this space, this, this orbifold point, we can model the space as, as having an, as being an S1 bundle over some S2 that sits on an interval. So the interval you can think of as the backbone of the original four sphere. The resolution of the cycle, what it suggests then is that the, the S1 circle will shrink at the end of the interval closing off the space. However, the S2 doesn't shrink at the end of the interval and the two and the S2 at the end, the two, the two spheres at the end of the interval corresponds to exactly the resolution uh, two cycle that you get by, by, by resolving the orbital singularity, okay? So now you could take this whole theory and you put it on a Riemann surface and then you want to know what the anomaly is. So you could do this in another way first. This, this way is to, to take the anomaly of the 6D10 theory that we computed, that you computed, uh, that we computed before, and just take that and just integrate it over the Riemann surface, okay? So this would be doing an anomaly matching across dimensions. You can just take that, uh, an, that, that, I, the, that eight form anomaly polynomial and just integrate on the Riemann surface so this is equivalent to anomaly matching between the 6D theory and the 4D theory. And then you get some anomaly for, the 6D, for some 6D theory. Um, and it turns out, so that anomaly itself is not wrong because it's anomaly matching and it cannot be wrong. But if you try to use that to compute, let's say a central charge for the CFT, 
we were convinced that you get the wrong answer because we had a potential uh, holographic dual for, 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 for the five brains at D2 orbifold wrapping Riemann surface. You just get the wrong answer. So, 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 so what is missing? The thing that is missing is that this, this case, this is a case where actually accidental symmetries can occur and, and certain additional modes can decouple. And this sort of uh, anomaly matching here basically misses that, right? It, it misses the decoupled modes and the accidental symmetries that could happen along the RG flow from the 6D to the 4D series. However, you can go back to the supergravity and do the analysis more carefully and then you could capture such a thing. So let's discuss how that works briefly. So now we want to have a 4D theory that's coming from these brains. So this is going to be an M4 times there is some six dimensional theory. Okay. So the R symmetry circle, which is F1 psi, must be twisted over the Riemann surface with some curvature in order to preserve supersymmetry. So what is the topology of this thing? So this space, it has three four cycles. Two of them corresponds to taking the resolution two cycles uh, at the end here and, and taking those resolution two cycles with the Riemann surface. So that will give you two four cycles. Another four cycle is coming from taking the M4 itself inside M6. M4 itself inside M6 is also another four cycle. So you have three four cycles uh, in, in my space. And in all of these three four cycles, you can thread some flux, right? You have three flux parameters, N, N north and N south. N is the number of brains that underlying the thing. And N north and south is, is, is the flux that has to do with taking, with the four cycle that is coming from the Riemann surface times these guys at the end of the interval. So since you have three four cycles, this is a six dimensional space by Poincaré duality, then you must have three uh, closed two forms by which you can study the fluctuations of C3. So since you have three closed two forms, then the fluctuation of the C3 would tell you you have a U1 cube flavor symmetry on the 4D theory, not U1 squared, which where U1 squared was the, the thing that you only see from the 6D, right? So this is the case where you see that there is an actually an accidental symmetry that appears, right? You, the, the 6D theory tells you you have this U1 north and U1 south. There is a third U1 that comes from because there is, because this acting actually have three uh, harmonic, three closed uh, two forms from which you can expand C3, right? So this is an example where you see an accidental symmetry and this accidental symmetry must be taken into account when computing the anomaly and studying this, this setup. But then there is also another effect that's, that, that, that must be accounted for. If you study the reduction of the M theory onto the six dimensional space, what you find is that um, one of these fluctuations from the C3 acquire the topological map. So the, the, action, the 5D action that you get by reducing M theory and M6 has this topological mass term where A alpha are the three vector fluctuation of C3 and gamma three is the fluctuation of C3, which is not along any harmonic system. So such a mass terms, you can dualize them to a kinetic, to a Stickelberg kinetic term. And you find that this linear combination of vectors becomes massive by eating this dual axion. So you go back now from having three U1s, three U1 gauge symmetries to having two U1 gauge symmetries. So what is the physical uh, uh, understanding of this? The physical understanding of this is that the Stickelberg mechanism was saying is that when I reduce the M theory, it looks like I have a U1 cubed gauge symmetry, but one of those U1s is spontaneously broken uh, by the compactification. So in the field theory, this means that you have a spontaneously broken U1 global symmetry uh, uh, before you, when you're studying the field theory, okay? But this U1 
symmetry that's spontaneously broken is neither of those three ones that we, that we described before. It is some linear combination which is fixed by the flux in this way. Okay? So then you go back that the low energy symmetry of the system is, is, is indeed is U1 times U1 times U1R times SU2, but the U1s that are in the low energy theory is not actually the same U1s that were in the 60 theory. The generators of the U1s that you see in the low energy theory compared to the generator that you see in the 60 theory is actually shifted. It's shifted along this TC, which is the accidental symmetry that you get. And this constraint is, is obtained by imposing the fact that you have, you have one that you lose uh, by the spontaneous symmetry breaking uh, phenomena that occurs. So you have to account for, for such a thing in order to be normal. Okay? So once you do this, you can go ahead. So I'll try to skip this. You can compute, you can write down your E4. So you have a top where you expand along the, the three, uh, the volume of the three four cycles. Then you have the fluxes associated with them. You have three two cycles. You also expand along them, right? And then when you expand along them, in the end, because one of them is removed, you impose a con condition to remove it, and that condition is this. It turns out the same condition could also be derived from the tadpole condition that we discussed before. So the tadpole condition already also knew that you had this, this, this both accidental symmetry and spontaneous symmetry breaking that, 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 that occurred in the, in the flow from the 6D to the 2D to the 4D theory. Okay, you can interpret the, the relation of the 4D uh, background field that you see compared to the 6D background field that you have some background flux that you turn on along the Riemann circuit. Okay, and then you can proceed and compute the anomaly. So here I write down the, anom the large n limit of the anomaly where FR is the background field for the U1R symmetry and F north, F south is the background field for the 4D, uh, for the U1 symmetries that, that, that we see in the end. So you can write down the anomaly polynomial and we've, here we've given the large n limit. And then once you have this, you can use A maximization and try to compute central charges and uh, such an observable that you might care about. And how do we know that we, that we get it actually correct? It's because we have a, a holographic candidate, right? So you can take the M6 that we have from the topology, you can write down an N thought um, for the metric, you can plug it in M theory and look for an 885 solution. So this was the solution actually already existed. It was known since 2004 as some exotic solutions in M theory. Um, and indeed, when we, when, when we computed the central charge and, and several and few other observables, we could match the, the, this, this solution explicitly, thereby also explaining the, the field theory dual of these solutions, which, which were known for 2004. And these solutions actually are known in other ways, in a sense that when the Riemann surface that I reduce on is a torus, right? When the Riemann surface is a torus, these are the same construction that yield the YPQ metric. So then you can go down to 2A and see dualize, and then you would get exactly the YPQ, YPQ metric uh, uh, that, that, are, that are famous in, 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 in type 2B, okay? So I think, um, I, uh, I mean, so we also have generalization of the anomaly polynomial for type 2B and F theory, which I will not say much about, but I will stop here and then take questions. Thanks. Thank you. That was, uh, that was really great. You, uh, thank you very much. You, you might get a chance to go back, uh, depending upon uh, the question, uh, you might go, get a chance to say more, but we, uh, we should try and uh, make sure that uh, there aren't any questions. So if anyone has a question, please feel free to unmute yourself and uh, jump right in. Could I ask one, Clifford? <clears throat> oh, go ahead, yeah. Um, so Ivo, in, in this, uh, let's go to the last transparency you have. 
where you mentioned these solutions, they were some t duality of, of ADS5 times YPQ. Yeah. So the question is, in, in M theory, you had only one field, uh, namely C3, that could contribute to this, let me call them baryonic symmetries, mm -hmm. um, that, that you did all this game with, right? Mm -hmm. in, if you do it in type 2B, you will have more than one Ramon field, right? Yeah, you could have more than one Ramon field, that's right. And, and they all will contribute to different possible different baryonic symmetries. Is that the case? Yeah, that, that's, that, that, that's right. So I can the give question, you... A, the a, question in the end is, is if the calculation in type 2B, I'm guessing yes, gives the same result as your calculation in M theory. There, there are two things. Um, so if I, in type 2B, if I have a five brains on a torus, that's actually it's a quote unquote singular solution in M theory, right? This is why you need to dualize to type 2B. Mm -hmm. um, so there, if I try to use my anomaly formula to compute the anomaly for that case, I would actually get something that makes no sense. The reason why is because the M theory setup doesn't account for all the, cannot account for appropriately the additional fluctuations that come from the, the torus in a sense that by the time I get to the description in type 2B, there are new, there, 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 there are various modes that decouple, there are new things that come, that came, which is, which you can understand as having to do with the, with the T-duality. But we were able to also understand what the anomaly formula is for type 2B. So I can just show you there. So in type 2B, what you have is an 11 form, which you must integrate down. Right, this 11 form has two main contributions, which is which are different. So this one is basically the F, the the NF field and the Ramon Ramon three field with the five form flux. However, the type 2B anomaly also has a new term which cannot come from uh, the the Chern Simon star. Right. So this new term, which is E5 D E5, which is written here has its origin from the kinetic term of the five form flux. So in type 2B, if you try to study the variation, the kinetic term is also anomalous, and this is because the five form is itself dual. Good. Okay, so this new term is, is going to be responsible for all of the anomaly coefficients that you cannot compute in, in, in M theory. Right? For example, if you try to compute the anomaly of n equal to four, in M theory, you get zero. Mm -hmm. Be because when you try to take the 6D anomaly polynomial integrated on the torus, you get zero. But we know that's not the answer. Right. And the reason why it's not the answer is because the 6D theory cannot account for the full two zero, the full SO6R symmetry because there is an accidental uh, right. enhancement that occurs. So with this anomaly formula, which we were able to, to find, for example, here to just give you, give you the answer, um, you take E5 is effectively the five form flux. Uh, in N equal to four, the boundary condition would just be the volume of the, five, of, the, of the five sphere. But the volume of the five sphere, you can then gauge it over the isometry, which is the SO6 isometry. What ha so, so such an object are called global angular forms. So if mm -hmm. you take these global angular forms in odd dimensions, they actually cannot be closed. They could be gauge invariant, but they cannot be closed. So yes. when you hit D of E5, what you actually get is the Euler density for the SO6 bundle onto the four dimensional space plane. And then when you go ahead and then compute the anomaly, exactly you get E5 wedge D E5, which then gives you an N squared times C3 of SU4 or the Euler density of the SO6, correctly giving you the anomaly of n equal to four. This is actually the first <clears throat> so inflow yeah. contrib computation of the anomaly of n equal to four, even though we've been thinking about this for a very long time, I see. right? But this is due to this, this new term. So indeed, if you, so then we were able to check this for any sort of a Sasaki-Einstein construction. And there you can check that if you take an E5 being coming from volume of some Sasaki-Einstein, you compute the anomaly and then you can get it correctly for, for all sorts of quivers. 
And this, so there was, there was an old sort of really nice analysis by ben, ben, Benvenuti, Leo, and, and Yuji, uh, where they dis discuss the anomalies um, with these guys. So this expression in I11 in I actually will match those, match those pretty nicely. For the case of the generic Sasaki-Einstein manifolds, right? That's right, that's right. And this thing does not have a counterpart in M-theory because this right. is coming, it's coming right. from the kinetic term of the type right. 2b theory. Right. This term could be interpreted as coming from the M-theory and, 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 and it is different. So if you want to compute the anomalies for things like uh, Pilch-Warner solutions, you mm -hmm. would need this term. Right. 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 Could, I, could I think about t-dualizing this E11, bringing it to type 2a? So yeah, so, so, so I did discuss too much type 2a, but type 2a, you can get there, you can get it two ways. One, you can, there's a term where you can take the, the 12 polynomial and mm -hmm. reduce it. Yep. Yep. A, and then you can take the 11 polynomial and try to do some duality, or more precisely go down to nine dimensions and try to see how to go back to, right. to, to type 2a to get the anomaly for type 2a. Yep. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Don't be shy. Uh, one more call for questions. Um, if if uh, if not, uh, Ibu, did you have any uh, other uh, sort of? burning things you wanted to share for another couple of minutes before we wrap up or oh i mean i can continue talking of course no <laughs> well we, we should we shouldn't uh, go too far beyond our time i just want i just wondered if there was a yeah yeah so oh. since i i could quickly flash the i11 for um for type 2b uh, okay I mean, the, but... the the next level of of complication is what it is for f theory constructions because f theory is where we have many many interesting tft constructions so i can just maybe flash that and i'll stop so to do f theory you consider some elliptic fiber on on top of type 2b background which is given by some uh, associated to, to to the to the type 2b coupling then this I11 gets generalized slightly. You have this new term that you add and you take this push forward along this, this elliptic torus that you have on top. The push forward just means in some fancy way integrating over this torus. Um, and then the, the F3 and H3 fluxes basically are encoded in the case where the fiber is trivial, are encoded in this way where X and Y are coordinates on the torus. So this generalized I11 could also be used for F theory sort of constructions that uh, that people that that exist that, that that could be used to 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 study uh, geometric engineering in those cases. Excellent. Yeah. One more call for questions. Hey, there's more. Let me one more, no. Clifford. Uh, and after yeah, this, no, please, I go, promise go to shut up. No, 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 this is great. This is why we're doing this, to have a discussion. You, um, so let me ask you something. This is something I, I asked to, to Federico at some point. Um, let, let me ask you just to get your, your impression on the thing. Is it, could it be meaningful to calculate the anomaly polynomial not at a fixed point, but along a flow between fixed points? So you mentioned just now the Pilch and Warner solution which is a flow. Well, uh, okay, the filter and Warner solution is a flow, but then I should say the Warner fixed point. Okay, good. But then, is it meaningful to calculate, to, to do these calculations along the flow? And so if along, so, what so along the mean? flow, so the, the, the data that fixes the anomaly is purely topological, right? Mm -hmm. so, uh, so RG flows preserves topological structure. Right. Okay, so I mean, there should be RG flows where, top, where topology is somehow changing, but to, to, those are interesting things which we haven't gotten a very good understanding. But if you have an RG flow from CFT1 and CFT2, so that, so that, that RG flow preserves topological structure. The, 
the, the trick is that um, along RG flows, you can have accidental symmetries. And so the accidental symmetries, you could be blind to it in the UV. And if you were blind to it in the UV and you didn't account for it, then you, you wouldn't get the right sort of central charge. Uh, but, in, in, but from purely from supergravity, purely from supergravity, it, tell me if I misunderstood. In the example you talk of the one zero theory on, on the Riemann surface, mm -hmm. purely from supergravity, you get the correct result. Yeah. It's just that field theoretically, you have to reinterpret these mixings of the U1s, etc. Yeah. Yep. So right. purely from supergravity, you could do this along a flow and trust that result. Is that the case? Yeah, what, what that means from the, sub, really what, what it means is that once you fix the topological data at the beginning of the flow, mm -hmm. that's all you need to compute I, the anomaly polynomial of the fixed points at the end of the flow, mm -hmm. because it's topological. Good. So if, you, if you're very careful to make sure you understand all the data, that, that all the data that, that, that is, that is in the UV, then you're good to go. Like for example, this this Tuckelberg thing that you see, you know, it's it's hard to know where along this flow has this happened, right? Where along this flow did this Tuckelberg phenomena occur? Um, right. But the the point here is that as soon as you wrap the brain, you had this extra U1, and this topological mass was, you know, it's there, and 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 you have to take it take it into account in in doing your calculation. But on, the, but on the field theory side, you would have to do a sort of Lorentz breaking uh, deformation from the field theory to set up this flow across dimensions. And somehow the statement is that when you do that Lorentz breaking um, deformations, you could have some accidental symmetry, but it's hard to say where that accidental symmetry is coming from and how it is coming from. I see, I see. Yeah. Thanks very much. Yeah. But topology should be fixed in a flow. Okay, uh, I think this is probably a good time uh, in view of the uh, in view of the hour uh, to wrap things up. Um, so uh, thank you very much for a really great talk. Um, I'm 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 sure the audience uh, feels the same way. If people want to unmute themselves and clap or or use their various audience appreciation tools via Zoom, uh, they can do that. Uh, but uh, thank you very much uh, from all of us here at USC, and thanks everyone who joined us from elsewhere. Uh, please join us again. Keep an eye out for uh, more talks, and um, uh, good health to everyone. <laughs>